Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Hi, uh, Matt. It's Lane Edwards calling from Vancouver. Uh, I played uh, Grant Brody in... Far Cry 3. I was hoping we could talk. I understand that you are um, a blogger and a huge game enthusiast, and I'd love to tell you about the process of, uh, of uh, making these games from an actor's perspective. Uh, so if you want to get back to me, that'd be great. We can uh, connect through Skype if you want. Let me know. Okay, thanks. Bye. On the line, we have Lane Edwards talking to us. From where are you talking to us from, Lane? Uh, I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Wonderful, Lane. We are actually having a bit of a uh, discussion about this uh, with Canadian actors. Which is better, Toronto or Vancouver? <laughs> uh, as a city, they are exactly the opposite. Everything that's great about Vancouver doesn't exist in Toronto, and everything that's great about Toronto doesn't exist in Vancouver. The best city in Canada is Montreal. Is that from a gaming point of view, or...? <laughs> uh, we made Far Cry in Montreal, and uh, that's where Ubisoft's head offices are. So a lot of great games come out of there. Ubisoft may have moved to Toronto, but originally they were in Montreal. Mm. Well, would you say, then, Lane, that Vancouver is a Far Cry from Toronto? I certainly wouldn't say it's a stone's throw. I'd say I'd definitely say it's a Far Cry. <laughs> Which is why we've got you here, Lane. Fantastic. <laughs> yes. You can see I've, I've been using that too much recently. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's that dry British sense of humour. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I like it. Well, the reason why we've got you here is a bit of an astonishing one, shall I say, because they've just released Far Cry 5, which you weren't in. You were actually in a couple of the ones before uh, in Far Cry 3, which has been re-released on the PS4. Which is fantastic. Isn't that weird? I think people have really been able to connect to that game in ways that they weren't able to connect with in other games. For instance, the whole idea of going on a mushroom trip in the middle of the game, which you would do in Thailand, was, I think, an awesome idea. And I think that's one of the things that really drew gamers back to it. Mm. It, was, it was such a creative game. For anyone who hasn't played it, basically, to sum it up, I think at the start of the game, you jump out of... you all Because you're all brothers, aren't you? Or... or cousins or your family yep. basically jump out of a plane and then you end up on this island separated yeah, we're, on a, we're, on a, we're on a family and friends vacation in thailand myself my brother jason who is who is the player and then our little brother uh riley who is played by alex harouche we are on a on a on a on a trip with our best buddies to thailand and it's our last day in thailand so we decide to take a, a skydiving trip and in the process of the skydiving trip, we get dropped onto this island that uh, we have to get off of. And Voss, who's played by Michael Mando, makes that a little a little tricky. He's a fantastic villain, isn't he? Amazing. Unbelievable. There were moments uh, working with him where, I mean, as an actor, it's fun to dance and it's fun to be able to to push each other, but he, he's great at just being able to push people right off of their game really quickly. He's a very, very good actor. So, obviously, this is going to be a bit of a ask for you, Lane. What do you remember about the production of the game? Because we're talking at least six or seven years ago now, since, since the release. It was my first opportunity to work in performance capture, and it really quickly became my favorite way uh, to work. Part of that was that Ubisoft was getting really good at building games creatively the same way that movies are made. So they were using film directors, and uh, our, our, our director really worked with us the way that he'd work with us on set. His name's Laurent Bernier. That made a huge difference because we weren't as confined as we might have normally been. We really had the opportunity to play and be free 
and to create. It wasn't just about walking back and forth across the floor uh, of a motion capture room carrying a gun. There was a lot more opportunity to, to find subtlety in the relationships between the brothers and and between you know our girlfriends and that kind of that that kind of stuff, which I think led to a lot of camaraderie as a theme throughout the game. But I think a lot of that came from from one of the first times that that in video games and in, in, in performance capture that you were really able to capture the, the relationships that happen between people and the, the emotion that comes from that. Those are all things that games are just starting to really get a hold of. And I think Far Cry was really one of the first games to start to map that kind of stuff. Emotion and, and connection between characters in a, more, in a more meaningful way for the player. Um, and so that made our experience on set so much more interesting and so much more fun. I mean, those guys, uh, James Woods, uh, who played uh, my best friend, Keith Ramsey, and uh, John Paolo Venuto, who played my little brother, those guys all became really close friends for me. Alex, uh, Ken Peru, they became really close friends. They're still really good friends because of how much uh, that game had to sort of do with camaraderie. So it was, it was a wonderful experience for me. Mm. So, I mean, obviously, we're talking six, seven years ago. Technology is still advancing to where we are now. I mean, obviously, Far Cry 5 was just released on um, PS4. And uh, obviously, it's, it's a sequel to the franchise. It's a franchise that keeps on growing, really. I mean, it's it's quite quite weird how, how the, the games differ from each other, but there doesn't seem to be a common link. I'm I'm just thinking they're going to get Michael Mando, Troy Baker, and and um, Greg Brick together and do like a you know a villain esque type team up type Far Cry, which would be a bit weird. But um, with regards to technology, obviously that's that's updating and still updating now. Where do you think it's going? I mean, I think that's the whole that's the whole thing. I mean, the the leaps have historically always happened around uh, you know sound, graphics. Water was huge. Fire was huge. And I think now what we're getting into is the, the ability to map the face and the ability to map emotion in the face and performances. So, for instance, there are, there are companies that are still using, you know, uh, voiceover actors with, you know, a model's face slapped over a motion caption performer's performance. And I think more and more they're going to be – be combining those into one person who can do all three and you can do all three in real time and you might have to go back and do some some ADR voice work but that's really common in film and television as well so I think that to me is from my perspective as an actor which is really the only only perspective I have in this I think that to me is the most interesting development and the most interesting direction that I can see the work leading because that's where you can like i said that's where you can really get into those cinematic moments and then take those cinematic moments and rather than have a break from the game where you end up in a cinematic moment that's really meaningful those moments can be happening in real time in the game as you're playing so i really think that that's sort of part of the way that that things are really progressing and going to continue to progress mm. i'm going to slightly argue with you there on on that point <laughs> the reason why i'm going to is because there seems to be obviously there's been an increase in shift in technology and that's fantastic i mean look at the games now the technology is obviously different to say 20 years ago but 20 years ago they were using voiceover actors you know like people who could do the voices basically nowadays it seems that we can put any old you know a-list actor on the game and that will produce the sales from that i, I don't know what your thoughts are on that lane well it's true i think that's common in, uh, in film and television as well. I think that what you'll find is more and more actors are going to be interested in, in doing these games and doing everything because of the technology and the way that they're able to combine everything. So I think you're right. I think they'll be able to combine a voice actor. But I, th I think what you might find is there are guys uh, like Michael Antonakos, who, who I just uh, I did a game with last year uh, or, or two years ago, who is the lead in a massive Ubisoft game that's going to be released, or may have already been released because he's announcing it, but uh, he's the lead in the new Assassin's Creed, and he did everything. He did the voice, he did the, uh, he did the performance, and so 
more and more, I think you'll find that those actors that are those A-list actors, I think are going to find it more interesting to be able to portray the whole character in the game because of how much the technology is catching up in us being able to portray those characters. So we can be emotional and it reads, whereas it didn't used to read. So an actor wouldn't necessarily be interested in, in playing that role. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can see where you're going with that, yeah. yeah. So just t- in thinking about where the games are going to progress and go go in the future, I think it seems like more and more they're going to be combining combining all three and just going by what, what you were saying about voice actors and, and A-list voice actors being slotted in, I think those A-list voice actors are likely going to want to be able to do all three at some point and, and really combine everything. Or is this the start of a new sub genre of actors maybe as in people who are specifically mocap actors absolutely mm. absolutely possible i mean I, I think michael antonakos is a great example of that he has absolutely found a niche in that world that really works for him uh and he's a brilliant actor but the the medium and the discipline is the best of kind of both worlds as far as theater and film goes because you're able to to show that emotion in sort of a close-up format, but you have the freedom of theater and being able to move everywhere in the room. Mm. So it, it, it is a different art, and it's I definitely think an art that some actors are really going to grasp onto and, and carve out a niche in. Going back to Far Cry 3 on its release, and obviously subsequently as time has progressed, have you become sort of known for that role? Yeah, I've definitely done a couple of these interviews. And uh, I've done other work in, uh, in some other games with uh, EA Sports here, and, and uh, I've been able to sort of capital, I guess capitalize on it somewhat or become known somewhat. The direction that I've kind of gone in my career is, is much more towards film and television. I love, I, I love that medium. Of all of the experiences that I've had so far, this has been one of the most beneficial, and, and it's also been one of the ones that I've enjoyed the most. Mm. It really has been. It really was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I mean, I've been saying for years, Lane, that I want to get hold of a volume. Oh, of a volume? Of, mm. a, of, a, of a motion capture studio? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't been in one for a while. <laughs> but yeah, it really is an amazing way to be able to tell story. Because in the other two mediums, you're, you're limited. In film, in film, you're limited by sort of a three-foot box and a camera angle. The camera always has to be in front of you, facing your face. And and so you've always got to be facing the camera. And then in order to shoot the other side of you, everything has to move to the other side of you. And in theater, you're limited because you only have three walls. So you've always got to be facing out. Whereas in, in motion capture, you're literally covered by every angle. And the limits right now are the technology so for instance when you have sort of this this helmet on with a camera and a microphone right in front of your face that makes it a little tricky to, sh- to really show intimacy and to deal with intimacy and those kinds of issues are the ones that you sort of have to overcome in motion capture but as far as the freedom to be able to play th- there's nothing better it's wonderful lane you've just actually highlighted something i've never thought of <laughs> If you've got cameras in front of your face, how on earth are you supposed to kiss someone? Uh, you do it without the cameras. They take the cameras off. I don't want to ruin too much of the too much of the mystique, but you can't show that like you could a close up of two people kissing on TV. You have to fake it. I might be wrong. They might have figured out a better way. Maybe I just haven't done enough scenes like that. I don't know. <laughs> They'll get you back, Lane. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk a bit about you, Lane, you yourself. What made you want to get into acting in the first place? Uh, I come from kind of a family of performers. My dad's a Southern Gospel recording artist. We grew up in church performing, and so uh, I've always been really comfortable in front of people. There's no shyness in me. And uh, the first part of my, the sort of the first part of my adult life, I, I spent in social services working with street kids and, and teenagers and and uh, sort of uh, at-risk youth. And eventually I kind of burned out from that work and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And at that point, my brother was already a professional actor. He was working on a couple of different series and he suggested I take an acting class. I, 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 uh, 
Uh, I moved to New York City for a while, and then I moved back and got into an acting class here. And that was uh, 10 years ago. I got really lucky to get into an acting class that was really practical and got me working really quickly. And I kind of fell in love with it that way. I didn't love it before I started. I fell in love with it on the job. Now I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I'm enormously grateful that I've kind of found it. I feel like this has kind of been the best part of my life. I feel like, I feel like my life's gotten better because of it. So. Hmm. Well, on the personal note, in, in terms of me, on a personal note, I've just turned the ripe old age of 30, Lane. Congratulations. Mm. They were my best years, 30 to like 33, 34. <laughs> well, actually, the question was going to be, what advice would you give to someone turning 30? You're capable of doing really anything you want to do. Don't spend a minute doing something you don't want to do. Decide on something that you want to do and then put all of your energy towards it. And, and, and spend a year sacrificing everything towards it. And then at the end of that year, decide whether you've accomplished enough that you want to keep doing it. And, and you probably will have. Well, I'm just looking at you, IMDb, because that's what I do. I know, I just look at these IMDb's thinking, uh, I've seen that. And I've seen that as well. Which actors or actresses have been your favourites to work with and why? And who would you like to work with in the future? In Vancouver, we do a lot of work for the Hallmark Channel. And I've been lucky to work with some wonderful, wonderful leading ladies. Most recently, uh, Pascal Hutton and I just finished a couple of movies. Um, and she was absolutely wonderful to work with. Uh, Lacey Chabert uh, was fantastic to work with. Jill Wagner. Uh, but a lot of those women that are working in, in Hallmark and for, sort of, for that, that particular network are really strong, intelligent talented women that are really good mentors even for me as as a, as a man they're really just great to look up to as far as guys go definitely the guys on this game john paulo venuda and venuda and james woods were were wonderful to work with being directed by uh stuart hazeltine in the shack was a phenomenal experience and uh and uh i think probably being directed by robert redford will probably Go go down as one of the one of the great experiences of my career. He was wonderful to work with as well. As far as actors that I would love to work with, well, jeez, uh, that's that's such a tough one. That there's so many great actors out there, but I'd love to work with Ed Norton. He's certainly been one of my favorites for years, and uh, uh, I'd love to work with Benedict Cumberbatch. I think the London trained theater actors. They're just on such a different level. And I'd love to be able to like spend three months just learning from someone like that. Well, you mentioned Hallmark. i kind of got to go there now. You'll find out why in a second. This is, this is okay. just, just weird. <laughs> the Perfect Bride. Yeah. It's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? <laughs> How so? Well, it, it's, it's about wedding planning. Mm -hmm. Just get married, Lane. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Hallmark seems to have found it, definitely found its niche with regards to weddings and Christmas movies. Mm. And uh, there was definitely a time in my career where I would sort of scoff at the idea of making them. But the more that I've thought about it, a lot of the movies that I get to make now with Hallmark are the movies and TV shows that my family watched growing up. And so I sort of put, put it into that perspective that they might not be for me. But I'm certainly making movies that families can, can sit around and get, get together with and watch and, and enjoy time together. And I don't know that it's that important what they're watching, but that it's actually time slotted for them to, to sit around together. I'm going to make a Deadpool connection. Okay. Mm, I know it's weird. Is it 2,000 miles away from where I am to where you are, Lane? Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Might even be further. Probably it is for It's probably 5,000 thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well... Funnily enough, yesterday, yesterday, 24 hours ago, Lane, I was speaking to somebody about Deadpool 2, and that person was Hayley Sales. Uh-huh. Who was in that wonderful Hallmark uh, film with yourself. You got it. I mean, we're all connected here, and you have to know this is a very small city. <laughs> it's a very small city. And so, I'm sorry, you were speaking with her? Yes. Oh, lucky. She's fantastic. We didn't have the opportunity to work a whole lot together on, on Perfect Bride, but we've definitely been out at some of the same parties together. 
the film and television community here is pretty tight. It's pretty small. I've always known with Canadians that you'll work on each other's projects more often than not. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's, it's you again. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's interesting in the sense that definitely there are times where we get to build relationships with really wonderful uh, people who who are artistic and and sensitive and kind of similar to us. And, and it's, we all, we're all kind of the same that way. But for the most part, a lot of it, too, is, is really just our job. It's what we do here, and we're all really professional about it. But we're all, we all kind of cycle through the same, the same jobs and the same, the same audition rooms, the same voice studios. You're always seeing familiar faces. So. Mm. Well, on that basis, you've unwittingly fallen into the ongoing question that I love inserting into these podcasts for Canadian actors. Okay? Mm-hmm. You ready for this? But. I'm a fan of Richard Dean Anderson. Uh-huh. Yeah, obviously who you know from Stargate. And the question is Lane Edwards. <laughs> have you met MacGyver? I have. I grew up in Calgary and my dad used to sing the national anthem for the Calgary Cannons, which was the professional baseball team in Calgary at the time. And they used to shoot MacGyver in Calgary. And he was a huge fan of the Calgary Flames, our hockey team. And him and the Calgary Flames and a bunch of other actors used to get together and do a charity baseball game every year. And I got to meet him at that baseball game when I was like, I was probably seven or eight. Do you know what? I've been doing this for like 10 10 years and I keep asking the question, thinking someone's going to say no. And nobody ever says no. (laughs) Everybody's met Richard Dean Anderson. (laughs) He's a very nice man. (laughs) <laughs> one of these days I'm going to get someone who says no well Lane obviously uh, we're coming vastly to the end of the podcast what I'm going to get you to do now is do a one minute plug a one minute plug to plug obviously the re-release of Far Cry Free and anything else you've got coming up great yes please pick up a copy of, uh, of Far Cry 3 look for me uh, I play Grant Brody and uh, coming up, you'll be able to see me in a Hallmark uh, production called uh, Summer of Dreams, where I play uh, Debbie Gibson's brother-in-law. Uh, definitely excited about that. Uh, and I think aside from that, you may be seeing me in uh, a few episodes of another Hallmark uh, series that I can't really talk about yet. But uh, keep your eyes out for me on the Hallmark channel. Mm. And please, uh, and please follow me on Instagram, Lane underscore Edwards fourteen, and you can follow me on Twitter as well at Lane Edwards. Well, Lane, it's unfortunately the end of the podcast. Thanks so much, Matt. That was a pleasure. I've played it. I can tell you, I've played it. I really did like the game. I thought it was very well thought out, and obviously the open world thing gives you tons of stuff to do. I can't fault it, and the fact they've re-released it just shows you how popular it was in the first place yep yeah so thank you mm. thanks very much for your time thanks so much for having me matt take care bye bye now